Om Shanti. So over yesterday, um, we've understood how our thoughts that we create impact our health. And also another very important secret that we've understood is who am I? And I'm sure by now we know that I'm not the body and I'm not the roles and the responsibilities that I handle, but I am the being who runs this body. But having understood this, very often we still get into one little trap of identifying with our mind. So I'm not the body, that's fine. But what about the mind? Am I my mind? Because when I say I, me, I still think about it as a collection of thoughts, beliefs, experiences, memories, everything inside, right? And so now the um, question is, am I my mind? Because then each one of us is a collection of thoughts, beliefs, experiences, and we are different from each other. And yet we understood that I, the being, uh, am a beautiful, radiant being of energy. And on that level, we are all the same. So am I my mind or am I different? And how does the, what is the interconnect between the mind and the brain? You know? And then how do I understand this and hence take full control over my mind and my intellect? Uh, very briefly, Sister Mohini explained this beautifully on day one, but Brother Neville will elaborate a little bit more on that. So I invite Brother Neville on stage and a very, very warm welcome to our dear brother who has come all the way accepting our invitation to talk to us about inner leadership and mastering the mind. And uh, I would request Sister Vijay Lakshmi to introduce Brother Neville. Om Shanti. So it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce our dear Brother Neville. He's Neville Hoggenson. He's from UK. And by profession, he's a journalist. And he has worked with The Times, The Daily Mail, The Sunday Express, The Sunday Times, in the sections focusing on health, medicine, science. And he became a student with the Brahma Kumaris halfway through his career. And he found that the concepts what we teach is, is profound and it is life transforming. And so he has lived and worked for the past 20 years at the Global Retreat Center, Oxfordshire, UK. And he specializes in talks on the links between science and spirituality. Being a journalist, he is also a good uh, writer. And he has published his first book, The Will to Be Well, The Real Alternative Medicine in the year of 1984. And in 2002, he published God's Healing Power, How Meditation Can Help Transform Your Life. And there is yet another book where he uh, published on behalf of Dadi Janki, the administrative chief of Dramama Kumaris. The book is on the topic Inside Out, A Better Way of Living, Learning and Loving. So we are here to hear from our brother Neville on this beautiful topic. Good morning and um, congratulations on finding your way to this conference. It sounds extremely interesting and I think I'm sure you will be finding it very valuable. I found, um, it was mentioned in the introduction that um, about halfway through my career, I discovered Raja Yoga meditation, which is more than a meditation technique. It's actually a whole different way of thinking about yourself and about life. And I enjoyed the second half of my career immensely much more than the first half because of knowing how to nourish myself on a daily basis in a, in a kind of, a bit like a spiritual breakfast, that every morning I would have thoughts and feelings that made me feel as if the battery of my well-being was being charged. And this made life in the office so much better because with that positivity I was better able to listen to other people, better able to interview, less ego-driven, you know, all of these things that really helped a lot and made my work better but also I was a better colleague, so it was great. However, because of coming from um, a background where previously my hope and faith in the future was in science because I felt that religion had kind of done so many bad things in the name of God, you know, fighting and all of these things. So I felt science was our best hope for the future. But I developed a very materialistic perspective thinking of 
spirit as being something that, if it, whatever it was, it was like something that came from the complexity of the brain. And so when I heard these ideas about being a soul and there being a, a supreme source of energy, even though I would practice these things and gain some benefit from it, there wasn't really that much power to hold that um, as much as I would have liked because deep down my programming, if you like, was materialistic. So over the years, that has gradually changed. And one of the things that has helped me is one of the things I'm going to touch on today, which is science at the frontiers that is supportive of the spiritual perspective. It can't go all the way. It can't, uh, science will probably never be able to, to tell you the real depths of, of consciousness because that's something that is completely immaterial. However, there is a, a sort of midway point uh, where science is getting deeper and deeper into an understanding of the nature of this physical world. And this is actually quite revolutionary and you probably, unless you're right up with this frontier thinking, you probably won't have heard of it in school or college. Although I have noticed that um, some of your great thinkers, definitely in your history, they had this deeper understanding about the, the ultimately very refined nature of reality, almost like a mental base to the universe. And um, sometimes in your newspapers, I came across an article a few years ago in the, in the, the, um, the Times of India, Ahmedabad edition, um, which was, I didn't understand it at the time, and this was only about 2006, but um, in the light of the researches that I've been doing, it makes a lot more sense to me, and I, I'll, um, I may have time just to touch on something from that. So, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to enter some quite philosophical and technical territory at times, but I've also got one or two audiovisuals which, which are very entertaining if, if I move through the, through the presentation. So, um, Ranjana Ben introduced the theme very nicely. The, the essence of um, this topic, from my perspective, is that it's, it, we have to really understand who I am more deeply than we generally do if we're to master the mind. Otherwise, the mind runs away with us. We know that, you know, you, you're, you can't sleep at night because your thoughts are running here and there. You get upset, you get angry, you get depressed, all of these different things which you don't want, but nevertheless it happens. So what I'm saying is that, yes, just meditation practice, quiet time will help, but actually, if you can see that the, 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 real, the, the, the real power could come from a, a big shift in your understanding of who you are, then that will be very, very helpful in your life. Let's see if this will work at the moment, not. <laughs> I might have to have that up here if that will move it forward. Ah, there we are. So, um, the power of concentration, um, and in the Western countries now, the Buddhist mindfulness meditation has become really quite popular. It's understood that it's very useful as a means of coming right into the present, letting go of the past, not worrying about the future, and that there is some power gained there. Um, and the understanding has been around for a long time that you can sometimes, if you're very still, you can receive information in ways that, if you're thinking a lot, you don't get. And this quote from uh, Dr. Watson, Sherlock Holmes's colleague, was exactly along those lines. That um, Could it come a little closer, actually? I can't quite read it to where I do need to read it out. Can that manage? Thanks, thank you. So Holmes knows the value of throwing his brain out of action. And Holmes would get some of his uh, big insights uh, into solving the mysteries that, uh, that he was the detective for. Um, something that is also pointing in the direction of there being more to our mind than the brain is this 
discovery over the last 20 years that the brain is very plastic. It is, uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, neurologists used to think that the brain was more or less fully developed by the time you were in your late teens. And that um, over the years you might get more information into it, but basically your personality and predispositions were fixed by that time. But then they've discovered, with thanks to modern brain scanning techniques, that actually the brain changes with every thought and feeling that you have. And when you have repeated thoughts and feelings of a particular kind, the brain will reorganize itself to help you have more of that. Um, so this also is very relevant to somebody who is wanting to master the mind. There was a New York Times bestseller, The Brain That Changes Itself, which, as the um, New York Times Review said, the power of positive thinking finally gained scientific credibility because the writer of this book w was um, brought together very nicely most of the evidence over the last 20 years indicating that the brain really does change according to how we use it. But the writer says, and the title conveys the mystery, the brain that changes itself, well, how can it do that? And um, he said, while we have yet to understand how thoughts change brain structure, it's clear that they do. This was the writer of this book. I would argue that he, although he did a very good book, he was ignorant of this fascinating development which is pointing towards the I, the, the core of me, as not being the brain. And there was a nice, um, nice headline in the Huffington Post a little while ago on an article by Deepak Chopra. who The, the headline was, Good News, You Are Not Your Brain. And this is really actually one of the central messages that the frontier science is giving us. So many philosophers and um, others have been examining this question, looking at the brain, trying to find a locus of, of, the, of conscious, the seat of consciousness. But as this, um, this author said, brain research has given up on the search for the pearl of self. There's no center in the brain where things all come together. In fact, there's a theory that the brain operates more like a hologram. Uh, you know, a hologram contains all the information about the whole of the picture in every part of it. And um, they're thinking that the brain may actually be rather like that in its structure. Um, this this um, uh, German philosopher, Thomas Metzinger, we cannot leave the ego tunnel because there is nobody Nobody who could leave. And um, the, again, this is betraying that, um, that bias towards thinking that the, the ego, which is a construct within the brain, is all that there is to me. But the, and the psychologists tell us that we need a healthy ego. You understand the ego is like a, a sense of self that we use a bit like we use the body to live. We have a sense of self, which we call the ego, which might be like, I'm six foot tall, I'm English, I'm a grandpa, I'm a journalist, you know, these things, so that there's some sort of structure about my thought of who I am, but that's brain-based. And they've shown, these philosophers and brain scientists have shown very clearly that that sense of self is, is an illusion. It doesn't really exist inside, it's just a, a construct. So this, these, these studies, these um, findings from brain science are important information for nudging us into understanding, although science, of course, is always very conservative, and most scientists are very reluctant to face the consequences of these, these discoveries, which is that the materialistic worldview is wrong. Another source of studies that has been helping to push the frontiers of understanding forward are the near-death experience. You probably most of you heard of this. It's the name given when people actually die, um, but then thanks to modern resuscitation techniques, they're brought back again. Um, because of the advances in these techniques, which include cooling the whole body, um, which can give um, a person the give su surgeons the opportunity sometimes to operate on a person who has died and still bring them back some hours later. 
Generally speaking, though, where there's a heart attack and the, the, the heart has stopped beating, the breathing has stopped, there's no blood circulating in the body, but the resuscitation techniques manage to restart the heart and the breathing, and the person returns. And it's really quite common, about one in five, according to a major study done in Holland, one in five of the people who have, who have had this experience of dying and then being brought back, gives a very clear account, a very consistent account of moving, uh, first of all, th their consciousness is very, very much still at work, and not in a garbled way that you might expect from a brain that was dying, for example, but in a very clear and consistent way, where the individual, uh, first of all, they sometimes they're observing from above what's going on. They can see the doctors rushing around trying to restart the heart. They sometimes see relatives, sense their, their worry. And then they, may, they often speak of a, 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 something of a life review where episodes that perhaps where they caused sorrow to someone and had never previously acknowledged it, it, they suddenly see it from the other person's point of view and have a realization, oh, you know, I, I did cause harm there. Not in a sense of, of um, beating up, just a kind of uh, awareness. And then, very commonly, they speak of moving through a tunnel into another dimension, which is a dimension of light, and that they speak of this unlimited light and a sense of peace and love, very much like the, the experience meditators speak of when they are encouraging you to become soul conscious and take your consciousness beyond the brain. This was um, Dr. Pim van Lommel, a, was a Dutch cardiologist who, who wrote this book, Consciousness Beyond Life, which is first class. Not only um, does he offer the science from his, his studies, but he, he puts these discoveries into the context of a new, a new understanding that's emerging within science of um, what's called a non-local non dimension, um, which is like means outside time and space. Enveloped by light, people experience total acceptance and unconditional love and have access to a deep knowledge and wisdom with indescribable clarity and insight. If you read the, the hundreds of accounts in his book, it's really extraordinary how consistent these stories are. These are a couple of examples. Someone said the pinnacle of everything there is, of energy, of love especially, of warmth, of beauty. It seemed as if time and distance didn't exist. I was everywhere at once. And sometimes my attention was focused on something and I was there too. People say that they, where they want their consciousness to go, they go, uh, with, right outside space-time. Um, this, um, this wasn't actually a near-death experience, but this became a, a bestseller also, Proof of Heaven, as, as this, this uh, neuroscientist called it. Uh, um, he had a, a viral infection that wiped out his frontal cortex for about 10 days. He was in a deep coma. And when he came back, he had descriptions of something very similar to the near-death experience. So again, he'd gone beyond the brain. Even though he hadn't died, his brain and his frontal cortex was non-functional. And so he, was, he, he encountered the reality of a world of consciousness that existed completely free of the limitations of my physical brain. My experience showed me that the death of the body and the brain are not the end of consciousness. This reminds me of um, one of the subjects in Pim van Lommel's study, which covered five hospitals over several years. Um, they said, um, I realized, this was when they were beyond, they said, I realize that death is just a big, nasty, bad lie. That's wonderful. With, they speak this with total conviction. Love is without a doubt the basis of everything. So often, love is offered as the, the key experience in all of this. No remotely accurate understanding of who and what we are can be achieved by anyone who does not know this truth of truths and embody it in all their actions. So you see, this is like an indication of what I'll come on to shortly. Some of the implications of these studies very much connect to traditional religious teaching. 
where at its best it has told you be simple, don't be grasping, consider others, you know, um, be loving, don't be egotistical and selfish. These sort of things, um, uh, right through the ages it's been understood that th these are good ways of living and it's not only because that helps to create a peaceful society, it's also because it actually, when you are loving and peaceful, you are, you have a better chance of accessing this hugely nourishing alternative dimension. One other example, this Jill Bolte Taylor is a great 20-minute um, um, TED talk on, um, on YouTube by this lady. Um, she was a brain scientist. She had a, a stroke or a hemorrhage in her left hemisphere that more or less wiped it out. And to begin with, it, she was observing the loss of function, but then she moved into this blissful state. And this was a quote from her experience. I'm the life force power of the 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses, she's referring to the body, that make up my form, at one with all that is. These very consistent stories that come from these people. Now, finally, um, in this data, uh, the, in all pointing towards the fact that, as Deepak Chopra said, you are not your brain, um, a study done in Oxford, not long ago at Oxford University, with psilocybin. Have you heard of magic mushrooms? They, they're a, a psychedelic uh, mushroom that used to be popular with the hippies in, um, in the UK in, um, back in the 60s. And um, they used to harvest these mushrooms and fry them or eat them raw, and it would have a brain, um, that was thought to be a brain and consciousness expanding effect. So this recent study, the scientists wanted to know which part of the brain is producing this beautiful feeling, which is very consistent with this, the near-death experience. And um, what they found was that when they put the subjects on measured doses of the drug and then they, they monitored their, the brain changes with um, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is the, the main uh, means of brain scanning that um, have made these breakthroughs possible, when they looked to see what was happening in the brain, they found that no part of the brain lit up, but a key connector hub in the brain shut down. So again, what we're seeing is that it was the, it was the bypassing of the brain that was allowing these people to have this expanded sense of consciousness. Get the idea? So, is consciousness a byproduct of brain activity, as most 95% of brain scientists would still hope to believe. Well, you can, they would say to you, look, if I hit you on the head with a hammer, you'll be unconscious. So, case proved. Or they would say, look, if I give you a glass of whiskey or something like this, your consciousness will change. Or if I give you an anesthetic, your consciousness will change. True, definitely the brain is having an influence on our consciousness. However, as this scientist said, usually the correlation is there. Things that happen to the brain, including the sense impressions that reach us through, through the senses, which the brain then is processing, they do definitely influence our consciousness. But there are instances where consciousness is, as Pim van Lommel said, beyond the brain, where the brain is not involved. So what is happening then that if I'm hit on the head with a hammer, why do I lose consciousness? Well, the conscious awareness that my brain is allowing me to have may be just one aspect of my consciousness. There may be things going on when I am, quotes, unconscious, but nevertheless, I am actually experiencing that consciousness, but then my brain, because of being out of action, doesn't give me the memory of what happened when I come back. So this was, as he says here, consciousness may never be absent. What we refer to as periods of unconsciousness may be reinterpreted as periods in which memory formation is impaired. So it's a very good answer to the, to the brain scientist who says, if I hit you on the head with a hammer, your consciousness ends. Case concluded. It's not concluded. So Pim van Lommel says, we've got the ability to recover our connection with this glorious realm. And I think that's what we're doing with... Um, 
with, with Raja Yoga meditation. We just forget that we do because during the, the brain-based portion of our existence, our brain blocks out this larger cosmic background. Is this, uh, are, you, are you with me on this so far? You sort of broadly okay? Or any, anyone completely lost at this point? Is it okay? Uh, I'll carry on. Oh, now, let me just here see if I can take that back a moment. Yeah, so this is actually a nice little, if, maybe this is all a bit mind-boggling, so there's, this is a nice little um, illustration of uh, what we're talking about here, brought home through the skills of th the makers of this documentary. It comes from a documentary, documentary called What the Bleep that was quite popular a few years ago. And uh, Dr. Quantum is um, visiting Flatland, a two-dimensional world where everything is in two dimensions, and then he's encouraging a little Flatlander to come out of that, that two-dimensional world and experience a third dimension. And you can see it's a kind of metaphor for us. We live in a three-dimensional world, and medi in meditation we're being encouraged to come out of that and experience something, something more. Have we got sound? Take it back, I think. Try again. dimensional beings that live here have no concept of three-dimensional objects. These two-dimensional flatlanders have no understanding of cubes, spheres, tetrahedrons, or yours truly. From their 2D perspective, my 3D finger looks something like this. Little circle. Uh -uh. Fear of the unknown. Or should I say, not yet known. It's a puzzle. If we see only what we know, how does anyone ever see anything new? The unknown. How do we ever 
get out of our box. Hello, little circle. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Who said that? Where are you? This is always the tricky part to explain. I'm in another dimension, another space. I am above you. Word. The A word. Above? Ah! It's forbidden. <laughs> well, what do you think it means? I don't know. And I don't want to know. You can be severely punished if you use that word. <gasps> Are you a ghost? <laughs> I hope not. I just had a different perspective than you did. I can see things in a way you can't yet. Oh, yeah? Like what? Well... Okay, you have a safe hidden in your pantry. <laughs> and inside it, you have 12 coins, a will, and a passport. How did you know that? What are you? Are you a god? Well... No more than you. You see, since I am above you, <laughs> in the third dimension, I can see inside things in your world. Third dimension? You are a crazy ghost. There's only two. Look. <laughs> so, if I were to touch the... Side of your stomach. How would I do that? Well, you'd have to cut through my skin. Otherwise, it's impossible. <laughs> Stop! Stop! No. <laughs> Ready for more? More what? Dimensions. Oh. Directions. Uh, no. Yes, but oh. but there aren't any. More? What will happen to me? What will I become? You have to become it to know. Okay. Excellent. Oh. I never knew. That's sweet, isn't it? It's, uh, it, it? I always find it quite touching because there is a resistance amongst us all to coming out of our material consciousness. And um, that was conveyed very nicely in that little movie. In um, Raja Yoga meditation, as you've already been learning, the, the essence of it is that we're understanding ourselves as a non-physical being and we're relating to the divine, to a divine source of truth. And um, when I began, I did, as I indicated earlier, I found that it was helping to recharge that battery inside, just by going into the gatherings where there were experienced yogis, because it's a vibrational thing, and you can feel the peace and the love when you come into the company of yogis. But um, as time went on, um, the understanding that I wanted to develop. Oh, oh yes, I see, thanks. Thank you. Um, the understanding that I wanted to develop, uh, I realized more and more that I believe like Sister Shivani was telling you about in her talk about karma, 
your actions and the motives behind them really do have a big influence on your ability to access this deeper dimension. And if your actions are selfish and body-bound, very body-conscious, then it becomes very difficult to open your mind to these deeper dimensions. So these qualities, like honesty and love, patience, tolerance, humility, as I said earlier, they're, they're all traditional qualities taught by the religions that are helpful to us, but they're not only helpful in terms of our relationships with each other, but they're helpful in terms of being able to stay open to this deeper dimension of reality and take power from that connection. So one of the keys that my big teacher in London for many years, who's now the head of the spiritual university, Daddy Janke, she was always telling me, think less, Neville, think less, because I used to think too much. I used this, uh, I came across this cartoon at one point and felt that it was a little bit like myself, that I got so much information in my brain that it was like a, a, I was dragging that around with me like this poor scientist who's so burdened by information that he, he can't fly free. And this was, this, I liked this, just penny for your lack of thoughts, these two, um, two monks. Um, meditating and uh, so that wisdom understanding that to reduce your thinking is helpful in accessing this other dimension that's been known for a long time so we have to love more and as one of those one of those near-death experience people said having had that taste of of the fourth dimension if you like on, on their return to everyday life a single loving thought would let me be part of the whole again that's how they experienced it now, I'm going to tell you a little bit now about something slightly more technical, at least it, it may be, and it's certainly exploratory, it's certainly, there are no final answers in on this yet, but it's a fascinating area where scientists are trying to understand the much deeper fabric of the, of the universe than classical physics allowed us to understand. Classical physics is that physics, you know, the action and reaction, simple physical laws that you might learn in the physics class at school. But about a hundred years ago, the, it was discovered in the field called quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, it was discovered that um, some phenomena, some aspects of the physical world don't work according to classical physical laws strange things happen, like a, a, a subatomic particle can be in one place one moment and then tunnel through something, uh, seemingly, and be in another place at another moment with apparently no connection between the two. And it was found that, that a phenomenon they call non-locality comes into play in the quantum realm, where if you alter the spin, for example, on one particle, a related particle, no matter how far distant it is, will alter its d direction of spin simultaneously. No time lag between the two. It could be at the other end of the universe, and the theory says that will still happen. And it's actually been tested, a, a groundbreaking experiment at the Institute of Optics in Paris a few years back that attracted very little attention, but it actually is, is evidence of the need for an enormous shift in our understanding of the nature of the world. Showed that, yes, this really is a reality, that these, this instantaneous communication is possible. And this Professor David Bohm, um, who was one of the early interpreters of quantum theory, he actually elaborated a very fascinating theory about the, the relationship between mind and matter, which is that both of them are actually related because they come from a deeper dimension, this non-local space, this space outside space-time. This is, this is a really revolutionary idea that actually has a lot of explanatory power because when you, it's, it's a complete mystery to scientists why our senses are so well attuned to the physical world that's around us. You know, the, my, my eyes, show me this table and these flowers and this cup and the microphone 
and I recognize them. Why is it that I don't just see swirling electrons? Why is my brain and my perception so beautifully attuned to what is actually there? Well, Bohm offered this idea that there is a, an implicate order, that this is the explicate world, the world of space-time is, is something out here that we're familiar with, but that it's run by almost like a, a computer program that exists in this deeper dimension, which, which he called the implicate order. Sorry, I'm needing help moving forward again. Ah, okay. So I better give a word of bit of word of introduction to this. This is my next little audiovisual clip from Dr. Quantum, and it, is, it shows one of the fully accepted demonstrations of the weirdness of the quantum realm, where mind and matter seem to be absolutely intertwined. So if you're okay, we'll, we'll run ahead with this now. ...of all quantum weirdness the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But, when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now, there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So. When we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought, maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits and... It goes through neither, and it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. 
So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. Very briefly, I'm going to touch on a theory that might be of interest to some of you as computer scientists. This is that the universe that we think of as the familiar world that we move through is actually being put in place by consciousness, by thought, via a huge lattice of switches infinitely interconnected at a deeper level. This is, this is actually frontline serious science. It's not fringe science. It's, it's um, emerging from the work of some top mathematicians in different parts of the world. And the idea is that consciousness is primary. The, the universe is, is put together by consciousness, which, is, which includes us, because our bodies are not us. We are units of consciousness. And there is a, a kind of program or software that is putting through this huge 3D lattice, putting in place the material play in which we're actors. It's a most remarkable advance, potentially, it, it, it's consistent mathematically. It helps people to understand quantum theory and this interconnection of mind and matter, which has been highlighted by quantum theory, m totally to the confusion and um, uh, incomprehension of uh, traditional scientists working with the, the matter-based model. And um, so the idea is that it also helps to explain certain phenomena which until now we've had no explanation for. For example, how sometimes, you know, um, matter can be manifested by certain saints and others. India has a long history of this. I remember reading autobiography of a yogi by um, Paramahansa Yogananda, and he tells of some wonderful stories, one of, one of which I remember was um, a, a Swami who could, who had so mastered going to this non-local space where it's as if the play is put together outside space-time, he had been able to master the ability to bring down from there the scent of a rose. <laughs> it was amazing. It took him 12 years and uh, at the end of the chapter on this, Paramahansa Yogananda said, seemed a bit of a waste of time, why not just pick a rose? But, you know, there are these amazing talents that have sometimes been uncovered by very, very dedicated people, especially from India. And there are phenomena well known in the West, like the poltergeist phenomena, where it's as if a section of the consciousness of the person, the individual, has, um, has broken off and is able to change their reality. Um, so that, for example, a, 
a glass that might be in one place suddenly manifests in another place. And it does seem as if um, this is a well-attested phenomenon that there's no explanation whatsoever from conventional science. But if actually we are really living in a kind of giant game world that is put together by consciousness from another dimension, then these things start to fall into place and can no longer be denied. It's the same with telepathy, it's the same with remote viewing, which was used by the American military for years, where certain gifted individuals could take their minds to a map reference and bring back pictures of what they saw there. All these phenomena, which have no place in conventional thinking because of the materialistic model, they suddenly, suddenly have a place when you shift to this, what's called this consciousness-based paradigm. And an interesting idea with this is that it's not really that there's movement. It's actually more that, that, um, that we are moving th a bit like with a DVD or you know, an MP3 that's showing you a movie. Um, it all exists, but you're just actually showing one bit at a time. So rather, rather than say that a particle has a trajectory, it's more like the movement of, of, a, of a computer cursor on your screen. The program, it's not really that the cursor is moving from A to B, it's actually that the programming behind that has altered where it's manifesting the, the cursor. And so these guys are saying that something similar is going on in our material world. Um, these, for, these weird phenomena indicate it, but actually it may be the basis of how our world operates. Consciousness may never actually go anywhere, but simply access whatever perspective it wants via the non-local realm from which it operates. This is confirmed by those near-death experience people who, when they've gone beyond the body, say that wherever they take their thought, that can manifest. Long distant memories, people that they knew long ago who had died years previously, suddenly they can manifest in front of them again. And this is consistent with some of when quantum theory was first being explored and explained in the 1930s, several top scientists said that it demanded that we understand the world differently, but their voices have been forgotten for many decades. Sir James Jean was, Jeans was one. The universe seems to me to be nearer a great thought than a great machine. It may well be that each individual consciousness, that's us, ought to be compared to a brain cell and a universal mind. And um, David Bohm also saying that the notion of separateness is an abstraction valid for certain limited purposes. One could say that through the human being, the universe is making a mirror to observe itself. Now, this, the, the value of this way of thinking is that it takes us right out of the body and the brain and even the mind, which sort of sits between the soul and the brain, and puts you squarely in the driver's seat of your life. If you understand that you are the driver, you are the unit of consciousness that, that has the control in that, in that region that's beyond the actual pro unfolding of the program, you can become the master of your fate. If you think that you're the brain or that you're some epiphenomenon, some outcome of the complexity of the brain, then you're just going to be a victim of, of life circumstances and how you think and feel at that time. If you understand that you're really distinct, you can take hold of the reins of the mind and start to really become the master. So the mind will still give you information from the outside world via the brain. The senses will feed that to the mind, but you sit beyond the mind and you can tell the mind, I don't wish to react to this circumstance or this is how I should respond to this. You are actually then no longer just pushed around like a, a ball on a pinball table. You become the master about how you think and feel at any particular moment. And you are then able to tell the mind how it should respond to the things that it, the information it's feeding you. As a uh, one, another of these physicists from the 1930s said it's difficult for the matter-of-fact physicist and probably computer expert to accept the view that the substratum of everything is of mental character but that's the way the science is now going this uh, this chap 
a, a professor of physics at Johns Hopkins in the States, he's aroused a lot of interest with his articles in Nature and elsewhere. There is no actually existing universe at all. The universe is purely mental. I can't grasp this yet, but I'm moving towards that um, the, the deeper I, I'm going into this. Uh, this was another physicist writing recently, it's not matter that creates an illusion of consciousness, like the conventional brain scientists think, but consciousness that creates an illusion of matter. This is absolutely mind-bogglingly different. Sir so Professor Sir Fred Hoyle, the universe is governed by some sort of interlocking hierarchy of intelligences. The religious impulse is our awareness of our connectedness to a universal intelligence. So you see how relevant this is to the Raja Yoga that you're, you're learning about here. The entire, uh, now this, this is my final little slides and um, I apologize if I've given you too much too fast but I find it so exciting. And this comes from that article in the, in the Times of India that I mentioned. The entire universe is a projection of consciousness. We experience the universe as a projection through us because each of us is a center of consciousness. There really is no here or there because everything is at one point where consciousness is. The reality of here and there is all created and experienced within the singularity of consciousness itself. Think of a computer program that runs a simulated game world where all characters are interacting with each other. It's all really just one program cycling between each character so fast that it seems as if all characters are being run simultaneously when they're actually being run one at a time. It's the activity of consciousness playing every single role in the universe that makes it seem as though they're separate programs running, when it's really one program running everything in turns at infinite speed. Those of you familiar with Raja Yoga, some of the deeper aspects of Raja Yoga, such as the concept that we're in a, in a um, permanently repeating cycle of time that has a very strictly fixed beginning, middle and end and is actually predetermined and predestined like a film will understand the relevance of this way of thinking. This is the final quote from that article. The reason why consciousness runs at infinite speed is because it's not confined to the boundaries of time at all. Time is a simulated concept that is created by consciousness to be experienced by consciousness. You see how this harks back to the David Bohm idea that the universe is a kind of mirror created by mind to, to experience itself. To experience your reality, realize that where you are is the center of all that is occurring. This is what it means to be centered. When you think someone, something or somewhere else is the center of what's going on, you're giving your power away to the external world. Move through your world with the consciousness that you are the center of the universe and you'll find that you don't really have to shift as people around you shift themselves. This was Enoch Tan was the writer. I don't know of him or his background, but I thought that that was very relevant to what I've been learning. So you understand that that's the key, isn't it? That we don't want to be pushed around by other people. We would like to be able to remain stable in the face of someone's abusive behavior or whatever it might be. And this actually is a wonderful secret for how we can do that. Yes, Raja Yoga charges the battery. When you separate from everyday life, you sit quietly in meditation, you connect to that realm beyond, you fill the mind with those good feelings from that other dimension, and that gives you the strength to lead your life better. But how much more power if you really understand that and, and, and are able to connect back to that source at any time, at any, in any place, anywhere, even whilst things are going on around you. And uh, Raja Yoga offers a dimension, as I said at the start, that the, the ancient understanding didn't actually contain. It's more to do with this element of love and which the near-death experience is illustrating so beautifully, that when you... What, love seems to be of the essence of what comes from that singularity, that source, which some would call God. Although the God in our understanding in Raja Yoga is not a God who is like creating everything. 
God, as we understand, is, is like a, a reference point for what's highest in us. So we connect to God as an unchanging source of the power of truth about our own consciousness. But the play is nature. The play, the, the drama in which we're actors, is nature. And God says he's a part of that, not the, not the actual creator of that, which is a very, very key shift in understanding offered by Raja Yoga as well. So with this sense that I can center myself in that place beyond, that singularity, where I am completely like a base point, I'm up in the projection room, if you like, rather than out in the play, if I can do that and with love feel that I'm connecting to that loving source, then I can really really become the master of the mind and the master of my world. So that was really what I wanted to explain. And if there are any questions, we've got time for a little bit, but um, I know I've covered a lot of ground, so thank you for your attention. Shanti. Om Shanti. Thank you for, for taking this topic. Uh, this is really a difficult one to grasp, but thanks for simplifying it and uh, sharing uh, your experiences as well. Uh, it's not a direct question as such, uh, but when I uh, saw the video, um, it's scary, first of all, uh, because uh, whatever I see, see, I communicate to the entire world around me through my sensory organs my eyes, uh, the touch, the feelings and all. But now, if suddenly matter tries to behave differently when I'm watching it, when I'm observing it, if it is trying to behave differently uh, and compared to when I'm not watching it, in a simplified way, if I, I now could see uh, the cam recorder, I could see the, uh, uh, the, t the uh, table, the laptop, I can see it and they are all stable, they are all stationary. Mm -hmm. The moment I close my eyes, I do not know where are they. So is this the real world which is, uh, wherein am I leaving? Yes. Or it's all imaginary. Now I'm afraid to use words such as real, true. Yes. Sorry to say that. You know, that's, that is a very good question. And Thank it, you. It really, you're right at the forefront of, um, of what does this really mean? Uh, because definitely, um, if this room was completely dark and the table was here and I walked inside and I didn't know it was here, but I'd still hack my shins on it, you know, there is a reality here. So what is that reality if, if the universe is purely mental? That, that I haven't fully grasped this yet myself, but I've got to this point of understanding that what some of these frontier scientists are saying is that mind is constantly put or consciousness rather is like the software running this program that is actually putting in place the material world at every moment and it's because ultimately it's put in place by by this sort of software and um, hardware interaction and it because it is actually perhaps according to one of those scientists I quoted who was saying it's like little bits of information that are these on-off switches that are just running so infinitely fast that we don't realize that that's the real nature of it. But if that is the real nature of it, then it helps to explain how even though there is a consistency to my experience of the world of things, of reality, that consistency is illusory ultimately. It could be and that because it is actually a matrix of information that is running the, the story in which I am interacting with this world, with my senses, but ultimately it's a kind of illusory thing, that would help to explain things like the poltergeist phenomenon and also things like um, the stigmata. It's another very good example. Um, and some of the things that um, Balabai was talking about, where the mind uh, over the body, you know, that if you believe in a, in a remedy powerfully enough, you'll heal. 
Um, and similarly, if you, like a, the witch doctor's curse on you, you know, you believe some curse on you, you will die. So th we do know that the, the matter is very susceptible to mind. And the, yes, the stigmata phenomenon is where a very, very devout Christians, occasionally it's been very well auth authenticated, that a very devout Christian can go into a trance-like state where they identify with Christ and his suffering on the cross. They, they kind of go out of their brain and identify with Christ, and they develop in their own hands and feet the holes of the nails that went through during Christ's suffering. And even blood can come from their head. And when they come out of the trance, it's all returned to normal. It's a little clue that, you know, what we think of as solid matter, it may actually be the result of a computer program, if you like, that's the way one of these scientists is putting it, that is running so fast and so consistently for most of the time, because there are physical laws that dictate how these, this world runs, so most of the time it seems like it's just lumps of matter, whereas in fact it may be constantly being put in place by this super computer program, this super matrix. Right, right. Thank you so much. So. Uh, uh, if, if I'm not wrong, can we uh, look at all these things as living things rather than saying non-living yes. and be gentle with them? The, 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 the boundary between living and non-living definitely becomes blurred. Um, for example, um, we, we get some common sense examples of this as well, actually, insights into this. For example, you go into a a mosque or a temple or a cathedral where a lot of devout people have been seeking to self-transcend in their love for God and the atmosphere holds something of that so that you go in you feel the coolness you feel the love that indicates that matter is not just isolated lumps of atoms but that there's a vibratory quality to it um, that's one indication um, it, it, sorry, what was your question again? Uh, saying that now uh, the matter also can be converted into mind and mind into matter. They are, uh, you know... It's uh, not really so that... It, it's not really that um, mind converts into matter. It's more that mind and matter are interrelated. The, the interpretation on this phenomenon in the Dr. Quantum video about the double slit experiment, which you can Google and find out more okay. about, it's an absolutely, it's at the foundations of um, quantum theory. Um, it's very famous and a great mystery to conventional science. But the interpretation that's being given there is that the, the, the wave function that um, I have to be a little bit technical here. Um, the wave function is a phenomenon within quantum mechanics that is like a description of where the particle might be. Um, the range of possibilities is where it might be, and it works. It's mathematically, it's very accurate, and it works, and quantum theory is considered as absolutely solid physics, you know, I mean, solid in the sense that it's 100% works and it lies behind microprocessors and lasers and a number of modern developments in physics. So, the, um, it's not that mind becomes matter or that matter becomes mind, it's more that, um, that consciousness is acting on the range of potentials offered by the, the wave function. So the wave function seems to be part of this matrix that the universe offers. And then consciousness, including our own consciousness, sometimes working through the mind, acts on the, this matrix to manifest reality in certain ways. And when that happens, it's as if the, the, um, the wave-like nature of possibilities described by the quantum equations becomes material. It, it, it's, it's as if you get the, the waves don't disappear, but they become tightly packed, according to one way of looking at it, and that's what gives this table its solidity. It's tightly packed waves, vast numbers of them, of course, but ultimately there is an extended quality to this as well, because it is ultimately wave-like. 
And it's that relationship with the world of consciousness and, and the solidity of this matter that means that in certain exceptional circumstances, I might be able to levitate that table, for example, or produce rapping sounds, or you know the other things that occult powers have sometimes managed to do. It's the world is not as solid matter material as we thought it was. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Om Shanti. Let me simplify and then what Neville Bai has just shared answer the question. When he talked about wave function and a lot of possibilities and consciousness solidifying something, I'll explain in simple terms. You're sitting here, correct? And you have number of choices. You can stand up, you can sleep, you can hit that brother, you can kiss that chair, these are all multiple options of a wave function. And as a person, you decide what to do. To listen, to stand up, or walk. All others have collapsed. Because at that moment, you had an opportunity to do whatever you want, but you chose to do one option. The wave function has collapsed, as simple as that. So the understanding you take from all this science is very simple. That I am the creator of my destiny. I create my life the way I want based on what I think and I, what I want to happen. Rest everything they will have their influence, but you decide, you choose. That's what science is coming around and again and again giving that control to us. You know what? We are learning as a part of Raj Yoga that you are in charge, you are in control. Gum Firake science bhi wahi suna raha hai. Yeah, they'll use a lot of different terms, a lot of different terminology, but the idea, when they talk about consciousness, you consider it as self. When you say consciousness, while it observes, that solidifies universe, that means you are choosing that option. At our level, we can understand it in this manner, that is sufficient. So you have options to do whatever you want at every single instant, even though we don't think about it. But you're only choosing one of those multiple options. And who is choosing that? You are doing it. And now science is saying consciousness is powerful. You can exert your choice. And to your question about mind influencing matter, in simple terms for our understanding, when you feel sick, do you feel good? When you feel sick, do you feel good? No. So the body fell sick, not the mind, right? But the sick body is influencing your mind. And a healthy mind, if you are very happy, how do you feel inside the body in terms of when you're eating or having something? You feel good. So both mind influences body and mind body also the other way around. Body influences mind and mind influences body. It is two way. That does not mean that mind becomes body or body becomes mind. It's just that the influence is bidirectional. Does it help? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Balabai. <laughs> And there's just one that's very helpful. One thing I'd like to add to that is that this is not a license to uh, think that you can just think something into existence. Um, there, is a, there was a documentary called The Secret that became very popular, which I think is misleading. What um, That almost seems like a license to uh, use your mind to do anything you want, good or bad. But what the theorists are telling us is that the quantum field responds not so much to desires or thoughts as to what you are. And this is a really important distinction. So at any moment, it's more, not so much a choice that I want this or I want to do that, but more I want to be peace. I, w I, I am peace. I am love. That's what the, res the field responds to. You have to kind of be it, and then the field will give you the power that adds to that. But it doesn't work so much with, um, with the, the thoughts that might come from your brain, because that's not thoughts from the, the heart of you, that's something from your ego. You see the distinction? 
The soul has certain qualities, and it's those that have the power to really manifest in reality. But if it's coming from the brain, it will be limited. It's your ego talking, and your ego will perhaps temporarily get what you're asking for, but it will, in the long run, it won't do you any good. So that's something I'd like to add. So my question is, uh, as you talked about the neuroplasticity, right? Uh, as it, uh, by definition itself, actually, brain changes with every thoughts and feelings. Suppose take an example, one person is, one IT person is stressed out now, actually. It's because of his past thoughts and past feelings. Now, actually, that brain is completely undergone some plastic deformation. As we know, plastic deformation is a permanent deformation. So when I started doing a meditation, my objective is to bring back that deformation into a normal state. So why the scientists put the word neuroplasticity rather than neuroelasticity? Because <laughs> if I wanted to bring back it to your original state, means it has to become elastic. <laughs> then only I can possibly bring it back. I like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, it'll spring back again, yeah. Okay, if, if you're defining plasticity in a t that technical sense that it's permanently deformed, then it's not a good expression. But it, the idea is to indicate that, that it really does change according to how we use it. And um, this, is, this has very important implications. There was a study among some biotechnology company workers in um, California where they taught the mindfulness meditation because there was a recognition that they were, their morale was very low in this, in this particular department. And um, they taught them something like eight weeks of mindfulness meditation. And they did brain scans on them before and after. And there are certain brain areas that are associated with positive feelings and some with low morale. And when they began the study, sure enough, these, I think it was these right frontal lobes, um, the areas associated with depressed feelings, were more active than average. But then they reversed, and the left frontal lobes were less active, which associated with the positive emotions. And at the end of the period of the study, they'd reversed that. So just in a very few weeks, you really can alter the consequences of past negativity and, and, help, and shift the brain over towards a more positive, we say state of mind, but a more positive state of um, elasticity or whatever. <laughs> can I have more question, sir? I like okay. Uh, my second question is neuroelasticity. Uh, I've not heard that before, but that's good fun. <laughs> <laughs> As we know, actually, Shubhaba used to say that actually Atma actually divided into three forms. It means one is uh, mind, and second one is intellect, and third one is sanskaras. Now our topic of discussion is actually mastering the mind. So our right now, actually, if I'm started doing a meditation, means my mind is not a master. So my mind is a layman. So, by using a layman, can I possible to make him master? Well, that's what we've been, um, we've been exploring, that you're actually m more than your mind. The mind should be a servant of yours. The reason that you feel, when we feel that, that we are mastered by the mind, it's because we are brain-based in our consciousness, and the mind is being influenced by what happens through our brain, through our senses. So then we feel as if we're not, in, not the master of the mind. But if we go beyond the brain and shift our awareness to that centered space where we're connecting with the source of love and peace and truth, and also actually the, the, um, the reference point of, of the human family, when we connect to that source, we empower ourselves and we're, the, the power comes to this side of the mind. It's like the mind is like a two-way mirror. You know, on the one hand, it's reflecting what's happening in the body and, and, and as mediated through the brain. But if you're too focused on, on that part, obviously that's necessary to, know, to handle your life. But if you're too focused on that part there, and you neglect this side, then you cut yourself off from this wonderful source of, of positive feeling and strength. So it's very important from time to time. And ultimately, the yogi aspires to maintaining that connection with this non-local source of, of, of power, even in action. But to begin with, as you're learning to meditate, you still the brain and the thoughts and the senses and connect in that way, and then the mind takes strength from that. It's like I said at the outset, it's like charging the battery of your well-being. And of course, that comes through to the brain as well for the reasons we've discussed. 
role then? So Prem Sol plays a very important role then. Very important role. Yeah. I, I, it's got to be God. Yes. Honestly, I feel this. I, because of the influence of our past actions, not only on the brain, but also on the soul itself, because the soul has had this journey through time, yes. and it carries the impact of past experiences, some positive, some negative. And so we do have habits within the soul itself of a negative kind. That's why it's so important to connect to the supreme, because that is where absolute truth lies. And with that, with that sense of connectedness, this is the real meaning of yoga, then I have God's strength to help me to react to everyday life in a much more positive way. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. For the past 50 uh, or so years, odd years, science has actually struggled a lot to find a general unified theory. See, when uh, I love the way you presented quantum theory, it's, uh, very simple terms. So, uh, the question that bothers me currently is that uh, you have a different set of laws for when you go into the quantum. Yeah. However, the same laws don't apply to our world. Similarly, when you go on a larger, broader perspective, you have relativity. So those are two complete different uh, sets of laws that govern two different worlds. Although everything is made of the same atoms and same molecules. So the string theory recently came close to answering the question or unifying the, both the theories together. So the question, now, but the re recent, recently string theory collapsed, as we know. So the recently, question... Sorry, what collapsed? The string theory. String theory. Uh, well, some think so, yeah, yes. Yeah. So... So, the question is that could spirituality and the things we talked about today over here, Raja Yoga and the way we talked about matter, are we looking at the question in a different way? Is it that we, our perspective is different and could uh, spirituality and Raja Yoga be the key, missing link yes. to join the two different theories? I think so, yes, I do think so. Yeah, I think that the, the struggle to find a unified theory of the way the physical world operates has proved, as you say, it's proved unsuccessful to date, and I think that's because consciousness was left out of the picture. But the, these indications that uh, by these frontier scientists, such as this one who's saying that actually the whole thing is like a, a series of these switches, like this giant computer program, with then consciousness being the software, the information that works through that, I think we may start to get towards something that is really comprehensive. But ultimately that, that comprehensive picture has to include a, a really different set of laws which relate to consciousness itself. And that's where the spiritual university has some real experts because you've got guys here who have been working for 80 years in understanding consciousness very, very deeply, understanding its impact on the mind and on our actions. So there are, there are some laws that, that relate particularly to consciousness itself, which are separate from the, the, the physical laws of the physical universe. Although ultimately, according to this way of thinking, consciousness and the material world are very interactive. Consciousness has put the, put the material world and its laws into place in, in, this, in this picture in order to be able to, like David Bohm said, to be a mirror for itself. It's like a it's like a giant form of self-expression, a huge play of uh, of, um, of winning and losing and finding and losing and loving and losing and this enormous adventure of consciousness in the material world with all the complexities of life is ultimately, I think, only understandable when we move beyond looking only for the laws that dictate how the the world outside works, because ultimately it may be, like some of those scientists I quoted, that this is really purely a mental, a mental universe. That's something, a concept that I don't fully understand yet because of the reality of hacking my shin on the table when I don't know it's there. But nevertheless, there's a lot of evidence uh, at the frontiers moving towards this kind of picture. 
So I can't give a full picture on that yet, but it's very exciting, and I strongly recommend you keep an eye, watch this space, because it very much involves um, IT as well, because of the, I have the sense that the incredible developments in the IT world are there within this huge creation of consciousness, this play in which we're actors, partly in order to lead us back to give us clues about the ultimate origin of ourselves and this enormous play. IT may yet uh, be able, uh, with its discoveries, which are probably extremely primitive, I'm sure they're extremely primitive compared with the nature of this, this enormous matrix. You know, the, the quantum theorists discovered some very interesting things. They, they put in place some really key understandings, like Max Planck, one of the founders, showed very clearly with the maths that there is a smallest unit of time. Time is not a continuous flow. Time runs in units, but those units are incredibly small. And so, you know, these, these kind of things um, connect us to the, to the world of IT with its, its on-off nature, its yes or no nature. And it, it's an exploratory field. Most scientists are still very locked into the materialistic paradigm, but there are some really exciting developments underway. So they're worth keeping an eye on because they give you a sense of, of the rightness of what you're doing when you, when you learn to become soul conscious and God conscious. So we'd better leave it there, but um, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Brother Neville, for uh, throwing light on uh, this relatively complex subject uh, and, however, showing us the depth of what has already been discovered. And, of course, then it's yet a personal journey for each one of us to discover the reality and the truth for ourselves. And like he very correctly said, uh, and we saw in the film that you wouldn't know until you become. So, <laughs> so that journey is ongoing. So all best wishes and thank you very much, brother. Um, just a little announcement. Those who haven't yet collected your gifts uh, are requested to stay back now uh, after the two-minute silence and take your gift from...